might get a little lost back here because I'm not as tall as Meg. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to start out by um, maybe borrowing a phrase from our friend uh, Gwen Griffin. It's a good day to be indigenous. Yes? It's a good day to be indigenous. Um, I wanted to also add my thanks to Kenan and to all of my colleagues who worked so hard to put this conference together. And we are particularly honored to have among our presenters, Gerald Visner. And I've had the privilege of introducing Jerry all over the world, from Minnesota to Vienna. Indeed, my somewhat ill-begotten reputation as a Visner expert has earned me more plane tickets than I can count. <laughs> But it is particularly poignant to introduce him here at my own university. Scholars and reviewers have characterized Gerald's work in many ways over the years. One of my favorite descriptions comes from Choctaw writer and scholar Lewis Owens, who describes Visner as a trickster, contrary, muckraking political journalist, activist, poet, essayist, novelist, and teacher. <laughs> and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Kiowa author N. Scott Mamaday calls him the supreme ironist. There's a review in the Utney Reader that spoke of Visner's literary canon as one of surprise and delight. Surprise and delight. And indeed it is this continual surprise of his work the new turns it has taken through, dare I say, four decades at least. And it continues to delight, intrigue, enlighten, inspire, and sometimes, I have to admit, can fuzzle me. So Anishinaabe Gerald Visner has devoted his career to upsetting the status quo, to deconstructing the term Indian, to redefining the mixed blood and to liberating the contemporary native people he identifies as post-Indian. His most recent books include the historical novel Blue Ravens, Favor of Crow's New and Collected Haiku, the book-length long poem The War at Sugar Point, together with Jill Dorfler, who's here today, the White Earth Reservation ratification of a native democratic constitution, and of course, the newest work of fiction, Treaty Shirts, from which he will read later this afternoon. But these are just a sampling. Gerald is the author of, if I did my math right, 38 books in multiple genres, including poetry, short fiction, the novel, autobiography, journalism, the essay, as well as theory and criticism. He is at once the most prolific of our most, and one of our most versatile contemporary native writers. He's widely recognized as a leading writer and scholar of native literature, the innovative author who gave us trickster narrative and gave it a contemporary turn. Visner has lectured and taught nationally and internationally. His work has been widely disseminated and translated into several languages, including German, Italian, French, and I believe Keenan just told us, what other language? Korean, Korean. unofficially. Um, he's a professor emeritus of American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a citizen of the White Earth Nation of Anishinaabe people from Northwestern Minnesota, and the recent principal writer of a new White Earth Constitution. He has received various kinds of literary recognition, including both an American Book Award and a Fiction Collective Award for Griever and American Monkey King in China. The Western Literature Association Distinguished Achievement Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circles of the Americas. In deference to his status as a scholar, he has held several honorific titles at universities around the country, including the David Burr Chair and the James J. Hill Visiting Professorship. But perhaps more impressively is the recent founding of an academic journal, Transmotion, 
which was inspired by his work, his language, and his innovative critical stance. Indeed, through his writing, teaching, and I can say personally mentoring, Visner has had an impact on a new generation of Native writers and scholars, recasting the very vocabulary with which we approach Indigenous studies. He is the visionary behind several Native literary series at major university presses, including Oklahoma and Nebraska. Perhaps most simply put, Visner's mark in the arena of Native studies is indelible. And I could say more about his achievements, but I'd like to instead offer a poetic tribute. This is a poem that I wrote many years ago. In fact, I think prior, it, it, on the occasion of introducing him in Minnesota for one of his many um, appearances. And the only thing I want to say in advance of this is, is in one of his haiku, he has the phrase, where Basho soaked his feet. So this is called, where Visner soaked his feet. White Earth, Itasca, Walker, Pine Point, St. Benedict's Mission, the Northwest Angle, Bemidji, Cass Lake, Franklin Avenue, shadows cast by our, your history in this country. Aguatese, linger like your presence along my pathway, wavering, beckoning at the tree lines. Your words echo, mingle laughter in the voice of crows, in the ha 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 of bears. The story in your blood, now deep in mine, twice and thrice told, fourfold tricksters, herald of orange, Griever, the American monkey king, almost brown, and Clement Folio, tricksters of liberty, chase tragic dancers, striptease, decode secret intellectual societies, walk backwards, burn luminous with dreams. Survivance, your legacy, wild tales, colorful crossbloods, humor howling from the pages, lusty like reservation dogs. Liberation, imagination, healing story medicine in your deep bass voice. Writing chants on the Nunabaju Express. Bass Lake, bad medicine, little elbow, gull lake, on the shoreline, lost and lonesome. Wei Wei Benavi, she is fishing. North Twin, McCraney, Rock Lake, Strawberry Lake, skipping stones like stories, dangling toes for the minnows, feeling a tug, a tickle, trickster nibbling at my dreams. Aguatesi, a shadow presence in these places where Visner soaked his feet. And finally, I wanted to quote from Jerry himself. In post-Indian conversations, he claims, I am a storier, and my stories enfold the creation of a voice, a time, and a place that is always in motion, or vision visionary trans-motion. And the stories create me. So this afternoon, we will have the privilege to participate in storied transmotion of this wonderful writer. I'd like to present a couple gifts on behalf of the university. So first, perhaps, join me in welcoming this um, ironist, trickster, word warrior, and tribal dreamer, Gerald Visner. Um, this lovely lap blanket that is um, a woodland pattern and someone gave me notes but it's it's a it's a native made company named inspired. louder inspired, inspired, natives, inspired natives okay and then let me describe this one as well um, it is from the Electaquini Institute it has Uju, hello in many native languages from this region so, thank you so much for your presence. 
So now we're going to move to the table. Thank you for your attention, and we will start this conversation. Thank you for these lovely gifts. Can you hear me all right? I'm usually not very nervous until after the introduction. <laughs> uh, because I don't know anybody like that. And uh, it's impossible to live up to the grand um, accounting that's been presented. Uh, let me give you an example of how I feel about great introductions. And you can't live up to them. Uh, a colleague at Berkeley, Terry Wilson, great humorist. Uh, he never invited me to lecture in his class, and I teased him for a couple of semesters that he must be insecure. <laughs> Finally, he caved in and invited me. Uh, but he got even immediately. This long introduction, he made up all of my accomplishments uh, ten times what Kim said that was actually in fact. And then he turned to me, and it was impossible for me to say anything. 350 students in his class expected Jesus. Or at least none of the Jews. Or at none of the Jews, yes. And of course, we can't see none of the Jews. So thank you for that gesture. I looked around at everyone as if I was a trickster Jesus, nodded like this and walked out. <laughs> and I didn't return. <laughs> Terry had to follow his own introduction with his own boring lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Kim, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm very glad. <laughs> so thank you so much for your willingness to have this conversation today. Um, except for the 100 or so people, um, it's very reminiscent of our first meeting. I came to Berkeley May, I think it was 1987. I spent three days with Jerry, interviewed him, taped him, and um, I remember you being very gracious with my sometimes not perfect questions and my sometimes stumbling understanding. So can I count on that again? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so I don't really expect this to um, have a chronological frame, but I did want to start the conversation today to ask a little bit about your early work in journalism. But perhaps um, more than that, to ask if you would speak briefly about your first discovery of what I think we could call family legacy or maybe literary lineage in the progress and, and how that impacted your path. Uh, Kim and I spent maybe 30 minutes talking about how we might just broadly raise some questions about things I've done and written. And we didn't want to be very specific at all, just general ideas, because we wanted it to be spontaneous, and so it will be. I was doing research in the uh, Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, I aspired to be a journalist. And was working on uh, traditional leadership and things like that in the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And the reference librarian who took an interest in me because I was taking an interest in the subject, I mean, you know how that works, no one else was looking into it. And uh, she said, have you uh, read the progress and the tomahawk? And I had to say, no. No idea what she was talking about. Well, those two newspapers were published by my relatives in the 1800s, early 1800s, and uh, I'd never heard of it. That shouldn't be surprising because so many generations since then, nobody's rang the long old newspapers, and uh, it wasn't probably anything uh, particularly great at the time. It was just a very effective and important newspaper. I mean, you wouldn't haul around editions of the New York Times for very long, and uh, neither did any of my relatives. I wondered, though, why nobody ever brought it up. Uh, well, it wasn't really relevant anymore. Do you know what I mean by that? I don't mean to be grim about that, but 
everything happened, the depression, uh, uh, wars, and everything changed. Mentioning the progress in the tomahawk hardly mattered in most discussions, but it mattered to me. In uh, March uh, 1886, uh, two of you uh, tribal members published the first issue of The Progress. And in it, they, on the front page, they wrote an editorial about the protrusions of the, that's their word, of the uh, federal agents and the administration of the reservation. In other words, they declared in the opening issue, this federal agency is not our friend. And we hope to deliver an honest and critical uh, source of information to the good citizens of this community. Something like that. Uh, later in the afternoon, the press and all the copies of the newspaper were seized by the Indian agent, and the editor and publisher, Theodore and Augustus Beaulieu, my great, great uh, relatives, were ordered removed from the reservation. Now, that's an extraordinary arbitrary authority. They took refuge in the Catholic Church, I'm happy to say. They were Catholic. And uh, refused to leave. Uh, they took the issue to the US federal court. Simple, you know, constitutional question, can you publish a newspaper? I mean, you would have thought that'd be a problem. It um, was ruled in favor of the uh, editor and publisher in simple terms. You may, according to the Constitution of the United States, publish a newspaper anywhere you like, on or off the reservation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The second issue of the Progress was published on, uh, in October 19, uh, 1880, about a year, uh, a few months later. And I read uh, pretty much every issue. I'm so grateful to the Minnesota Historical Society for gathering all of these copies. They didn't have a complete uh, set, but virtually everything. It ran until the early 20s. The name changed to the Tomahawk. And it's because of this extraordinary newspaper that I was able to write a historical novel about natives on the reservation going to the First World War, because they would have been reading this newspaper. And I could make them sophisticated, cosmopolitan citizens. They had as much knowledge from a native newspaper, because they were patent sized, you know what that means? They would buy uh, pre-printed, uh, New York Times, Boston Globe, and uh, the Baltimore Sun put together these patent insides. They were national, international news. They'd ship out to thousands of newspapers around the country. They'd pour the lead in them and print them on a, a manual press. So they were called, they were inserts. And so families on the reservation were reading the same kind of material that anybody else outside of New York or Baltimore was reading or Boston. So they could understand what was going on in the world and had a knowledge of the First World War before the U.S. entered it. And um, I'm going on too much about that. This isn't a lecture, this is a discussion. <laughs> I'm interested in that too because um, I remember in, in one of your pieces you talk about that moment and how it was transformational for you, that you found your own. That's where I was going. It took a long time. Thank you. <laughs> um, you see what an extraordinary teacher she is. <laughs> this is her seminar. Okay. I'm, finally, I'm in her seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I uh, had to look uh, for models of being a journalist to you know, uh, national newspapers. Now, I have my own family as a model. What a great insecurity that was. I had no longer uh, an apology for uh, uh, imitating the New York Times. I could imitate uh, Theodore's great editorial in Progress in the Tomahawk. Good, and, and I guess maybe to follow that up, we're talking a little bit about your journalism because um, I'm interested in the kind of things that you, uh, well maybe one story that, that people would like to hear is, is how you came to actually work for the Minneapolis Tribune, was it called Tribune at the time? Um, but also 
so the kind of stories that you were doing, that um, your relationship with the advocacy work in Native communities and how that was linked to the reporting and later the editorials that you would write. Um, and I, I guess a few of them that are, are particularly significant as I think about it would be like the Thomas James Whitehawk or um, interestingly your work on AIM. Um, Dan White, yep. Yeah. Dan Michael White, sir, sure. yeah. Uh, I couldn't find a job graduating from college in 1960. There weren't any. And um, all of that was available was social service type things through states or counties. So I did well on the exam. And then I luckily had veterans preference, which put me in a position where they had to interview me. There was no such thing as entitlements for natives at the time. Uh, so um, they had to interview me. And the jobs I wanted, they wouldn't hire me in northern Minnesota because there were prisoners on the caseload. Uh, so all the jobs I kind of wanted, like a social worker, a mutual aid walker, uh, you know, welfare worker, I couldn't get. Um, so I ended up at the uh, state uh, reformatory in St. Cloud. And nobody wanted that job, and so I got <laughs> a social worker at the reformatory. Well, of course, anybody who goes to work in a place like that, you rush to the round file, you know, like everybody who's ever been there see if any of your relatives were there. My goodness, my two uncles had been there in the 1920s, one for stealing a six pack of beer and the other one for what was called carnal knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't want to make fun of that, except to say it's a ridiculous way to talk about, uh, uh, in many cases, personal relationships, not always, of course, but in this case it was. And, um, uh, the warden found out that I was reading about my own family, and there in the file uh, were letters from my grandmother. Oh, very moving, in prison, right? She'd visit every couple of weeks and bring the dog named Tim. And her strategy was the boys missed the dog, and the boys were trustees working on the farm, so they weren't in custody. And she'd bring the dog there and hope the dog could stay, but every time ordered to take the dog back, finally the dog disappeared after a couple of months of visiting, and the warden wrote and said, it was all in the file, uh, dear Mrs. Beaulieu, you're, uh, you left your dog here and we found it, so come and get it. And well, she just couldn't get it, and every time she showed up, the dog disappeared, and this went on for a couple of months, these urgent messages from the warden, we don't allow animals here. Finally, he gave in, and the last message was, uh, we've made an exception, uh, Alice Bowie. <laughs> the, the inmates so love Timmy, we decided to allow him to stay. And then about six years after that, uh, the boys were in prison for one year. Uh, about six years later, the, war the dog stayed. Uh, the warden wrote, Dear Alice Bowden, I regret to inform you that Timmy died yesterday and we buried him on the hill overlooking the farm. I never would have known any of an archive I had never, ever found. If for some strange reason, a trickster chance, I end up with a job nobody else wanted and found those documents. Well, the warden wanted to fire me because it had to be in the blood. And uh, the next test then, after my second week there, was to uh, put on this great rage of the Constitution that I'll bring a lawsuit down upon you, you'll never recover from. I had no idea what any of that would mean. <laughs> but it created enough problem that he decided to overlook it and see if I really was a criminal after a couple of months, and I wasn't, so I stayed. <laughs> so then um, your, your journalistic work with the Minneapolis paper. Oh yeah, I never got there. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped at jail. 
I stopped it. Yeah. Oh, I write to my mother on inmate stationery. <laughs> uh, my mother didn't have much interest in me. That's why it was really a delightful uh, irony. Uh, she had no idea of anything about me. So I write on inmate stationery and say, I've got this wonderful job. I thought I'd let you know. <laughs> so she was convinced I was finally ending up where she thought I would be after she abandoned me. Um, I was working on the streets for a couple of years. Um, I don't know why anyone would do this. I truly mean it. It's uh, deeply painful. Uh, you're working with people who are desperate and hurt, and that's all you hear. Uh, some humor, but not enough humor uh, to uh, make your day feel good. And, um, but my family came into the city just like that. And this was the urban reservation in Minneapolis, about 5,000 natives living on or around Franklin Avenue and Elliott Park, you know, kind of near the city, and near the downtown. It was the dumpiest housing, and that's how those things happen. And, and uh, a lot of Indian bars, very heavy drinking, most popular and notorious was Hello, Dollies. And um, I worked in this, and I, so I was an advocate. That's how I defined myself, and I advertised myself in this way. I'll do anything to represent you because I think I know how to do things, because I know the city and the agency. Just don't lie to me. Well, of course people lied to me. But they were much more creative in their lives, <laughs> so that we could work with it. You see what I mean? And it, it became a kind of bond of, of course I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the absolute truth because I'll have to take responsibility for some of it. You know what I mean? So it's a good lie that creates a bond, and I kept emphasizing, just don't lie to me, speak the truth, and I'll represent you. And it worked out pretty well. I, I don't ever remember feeling that I was betrayed by this game. Let's see what I can get if I can. It was really difficult. I'm going to give you just one example and then get to the newspaper. Uh, a woman called from a phone booth. I just had one phone number. It was through a settlement house, and then they'd let me know. And she was waiting in this phone booth. And I went to get her and fed her and got her some Salvation Army clothes. She had nothing. And brought her to the settlement house. And she said she was an alcoholic, uh, uh, welfare took her children. You see what kind of day this was. I did something no one should ever do, and certainly you can't do it now. But it was possible then, uh, with this kind of bond that I had on the streets, to be rough in this way. I said, you listen in on the extension. I'm going to call up. Every, through the directory, every social service and welfare agency in the city to tell them your circumstances and how can they help. And she listened, and I called, and every agency had some very well-stated social work explanation why she didn't quite call, qualify for the services they provide. And at the end of the day, she was in a kind of state of uh, hysterical joy. She was, this is dangerous. She was liberated from the illusion that some agency could help her out. I didn't do this very often. Uh, it was too risky. But she seemed, she had some humor about her own situation, and it seemed to work for her. I said, you know, the Salvation Army is a wonderful institution. They don't want you to be anybody. They just want you to feel good about yourself. And if you come to God, they'll help you. But they don't missionize. Wonderful people. And uh, they were good to me, too. They would say, well, we'll always provide a couple of nights in a hotel for people who send to us. And so I said, you've got two nights. I can't take you home, of course. I'll buy you dinner. We'll tell some stories.
and then um, working in the community um, as an advocate, you began to encounter political situations of the cities, and how did that lead to the journalism, though? When you uh, there was an organization, uh, well-meaning, of course, as they all were at the time, called the American Indian Employment and Guidance Center. Uh, run by, I mean, choose your time in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, and you can find dozens of organizations like that. I mean, they all were earnest and really wanted to help. They had good hearts, but it, I, I would call, here's my metaphor for it. It was kind of manger social work. You know what I mean? If you believe in the manger of our civilization, meaning monotheism, God, country, nationalism, we'll help you out. It's a kind of manger of our beliefs, and if you come along with us, and we'll help you out. Uh, these are real big shots on this board. Uh, lawyers, the executive editor of the Minneapolis Tribune, here, here's how I tried my best not to get a job, and did. And uh, I had to work with them a bit because they were stupid and patronizing. Good people, stupid and patronizing because they had completely internalized the entire ethnography of who Indians are. Mm -hmm. See, it, it's just, it, it's still in the air, you know that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, but now it's, you can play with it, you know. I mean, somebody who actually still says things like that, you can joke a bit and be nice and joke, and then they realize what's happening. But then it was the law of manners. So I set out to uh, dismantle that organization. I mean, these were pretty big people. But I had a good lawyer friend who was uh, once in the Congress party, so that didn't help. Uh, but he was dedicated to helping people. The fact that he had a history of communism was helpful. He told me, uh, I don't think I have to help you at all at first, because if you just read bylaws, I think you're smart enough to figure out how you can get rid of them. And so I did, and uh, and then I slowly changed the bylaw here and there, because I was named to the board, right? And got these bylaws passed, and the critical one was hidden in several. If you miss one meeting of the board, you could be expelled. And so I had surprise meetings and expelled the whole board. <laughs> uh, it took about three, four months. But so I, I got rid of the executive editor. I got rid of a couple of big businessmen in Minneapolis. This was not a career building experience. <laughs> I'm not trying to make myself look like I was superior. I, this was necessary to do some of the work we were doing. Okay, about six months later, there was a big conference at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and the National Association of uh, Journalists, I'm not sure what it was called then. And they're from all over, great papers all over, and you know, a huge auditorium of 500, 600 people. And I was invited to speak with a brilliant woman named Gwen Jones Davis, black, fierce, small. You would, you would want to kind of protect her when you first saw her. She was so small and so well you wanted to be in her good company to protect her. But fierce and powerful beyond belief. So the two of us were to talk about Indians and blacks in Minneapolis. And um, she started out, I'm not going to repeat the language because you would run away and the university would not consider it wise for me to repeat so many words in this context. I'll just give you some first letters. M, F, C, S, are those good enough? Okay. <laughs> she went on in, uh, now she had a, where this voice came from in this small, beautiful person, this incredible voice of, uh, it's not rage, that too, but that, that just doesn't do it. This was opera rage. You know, this was horse and well. <laughs> miniature dragon. 
And she went on about you, MFs and CSs, and sit your asses down or get the out of here. Well, because these, you know, these conferences are great. People are chatting. You know, they haven't seen each other for a long time. And, uh, well, they're frozen in place. The ones seated were wishing they weren't there. And I'm ready to flee because there's no way I'd be able to talk to this group. She just poisoned me. It's finished. And people standing, I could see them. <laughs> Am I coming or going? <laughs> and uh, then she just ordered them down, ducked and sat down. Then she just walked up the middle here and looked at everyone, smiled, and of course they're terrified that somehow she's going to personalize those words. And then she comes back down, smiling, calmly says, in a loving voice, if that bothered you, <laughs> then you would never understand what I have to say about poverty, sexism. What an audience that was. So she set up the audience for me, and I went after the Minneapolis Tribune and its racist advertising. They used to use Indians to advertise automobiles and outdoor equipment. It was a weirdest competition. I don't know if you remember this, some of you, that you know, these great hunters and outdoorsmen would have to outdo Indians in the advertisements. Be some Indian with a broken tooth and a big nose and a broken feather, you know, to look like they're kind of dumb. Therefore, I'm a better hunter than he was, you know, that sort of thing. And I went after the Tribune, and uh, at the end, the executive editor came up, Bauer Hoffman, and handed me his card. I don't know why I did this, but if somebody gives you a card, it's a bit much. Really. And circumstances like that, you know, I mean, and it's embossed. You know, I feel it. <laughs> Nobody does this anymore because it's so embarrassing. You know? <laughs> and so I feel it and I said, ooh, embossed card. <laughs> You're very important. <laughs> and he said, come see me. Kia, I'll come see you. Well, I didn't. After a couple of months, he sent his best reporter, Dick Cunningham, to seek me out. He found me and said, listen, he gave me a lecture. You got to do this. You know, the guy, you know, you got your bit done. Now go talk to him. I did. I walked in. He said, I want to hire you to write this like the way you spoke. So what I did. And I kicked him off his board. And then <laughs> insulted him in the newspaper. And he wanted to hire him. I thought, hey, this is going to turn out to be a career thing after all. <laughs> And so I said, no. <coughs> he wanted me to write editorials. And I said, I can't write editorials, and I'm not going to let you tell me how to write them. Uh, but I'll make a deal. Uh, this is April. Uh, hire me June 1st. And as a staff writer, you know, like you hire J school graduates. And I'll do that for a year and let you know if I want to write editorials. Well, of course, I did after some years write editorials. So I report for work on June 1st, uh, 1968, and that's a Monday. <laughs> oh no, it's a, no, it isn't. I think it's I think it's a uh, second of June is a Monday, and uh, a couple of days later, Robert Kennedy is assassinated, and the city editor. Frank Premack called me over and said, I'm giving you your first assignment uh, for the Sunday feature section of the Sunday paper. Uh, front page, if it's worth a shit, I want you to write about how America is not a violent country. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Kennedy's name a half dozen other and I thought, now, is this conspiratorial? Bauer's going to get rid of me after all? You know, I mean, you know, these guys are, have this potential. So I decided to write it, and um, I did discover that it wasn't a violent time. 
First of all, there's several kinds of violence. There's mob violence, which you're an ordinary, you know, gangster mob, mafia violence. That was all over Minneapolis in the 30s. In fact, my, mob, my father, in fact, was killed by a mob person. Uh, that's a different story. But, uh, so, uh, I found out in the research that, uh, I know how to use a library, that's what helped. Um, and um, so I found out that the most difficult time would have been in the West in the late 1800s. Not so much because somebody would kill you because you did something, but because you, everybody was in the line of fire <laughs> in small towns. And uh, looking at the data of assassinations and homicides, the 1930s, the 1860s, in American cities, far greater. Minneapolis in the 1930s, when my father was killed, had 36 unsolved homicides. Now, I have to tell you that I didn't know the Tribune had written about my father at that time. Mm -hmm. I knew he had died that way by uh, murder, but I didn't know the circumstances, and I didn't know it was unsolved. And I found out by doing the research and writing about that being a violent time in history. So I presented my story. It was about five, six pages. You can do that much for a feature story. And uh, dropped it in. You know, you had to paste them together in the old days, you know, with a yellow copy. And then you fold it up like an accordion and drop it. And then you go off a bit and watch. And then the editor pulls it out and does things to it. <laughs> He shouted at me, Frank Premack called me over and said, oh, we'll go front page. I proved it. Uh, so I then realized that this is how Frank Premack got rid of people. If you couldn't handle a difficult story and you claim you're a journalist and you have a byline at this newspaper, you're out of here. I don't want to waste any more time. So this was a gift to him. You know, violence? Let's see what business can do. Because I don't want to spend a lot of time dealing with this uh, rebel. So we bonded over that. I'm serious. And then one day, after about a year, I'm on assignment in Northern Minnesota writing about uh, reservation economic development. It was before casinos, so it looked pretty rudimentary. It would be like a laundromat. You know, it was a revolution. And uh, been drinking with friends, not heavily, but drinking with friends and having a good time on a budget. That was new for me. <laughs> and uh, I get back about midnight, and pre nice got an urgent message, call me at any hour. Uh, I want you to be in Sisseton, South Dakota tomorrow morning for a funeral of Dane White, Dane Michael White, 13 years old. So, uh, who committed suicide. So, um, I just got the car and drove, but I managed to get there about an hour before. And uh, Frank Premack had, Frank Premack had this saying that he drove through and was crazy about. The second, and he shouted out about once a week in the newsroom. I understand this was great uh, romance in the rooms, not like now where you're in a cubicle with a computer. You know, it opened, so everybody listening to the tease and the humiliation. He'd shout out once a week, the second coming of Christ is worth a page and a half in this newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> the reason he would shout that is because everybody thought that he had golden prose and, you know, it would go on forever about the obvious and never get to the lead what the story was about. And also, a page and a half could be put on the front page and not jump. Critical, because you lose mm -hmm. three-fourths of your readers if you jump. So we did decide we wanted to talk about that. So I'm going to read the story to you. Now, I filed it on, uh, it was published on uh, November 21st, 1968. Sisseton, South Dakota.
Sisseton, South Dakota. Catholic funeral services for Dane White were held here in English and the Dakota language at St. Catherine's Indian Mission School Church. Following the services, attended by 75 people, all but six of whom were Dakota Indians, Dane was buried here in St. Peter's Catholic Cemetery. Born in Sisseton 13 years ago, he took his own life Sunday in the Wilkin County Jail, Breckenridge, Minnesota, where he had been held since October 7th, awaiting a juvenile court hearing. The services and burial for the young Dakota Indian were attended by his father, Cyrus White, Browns Valley, Minnesota, his mother, Burden Arnell, Chicago, Illinois, his maternal and paternal grandparents, his older brother, Timothy, 15, three younger sisters, Jody 12, Joan 11, Mary 9, and many of his school friends. The Reverend William Kihohan conducted the service. Two hymns were sung in the Dakota language. Dane is here in the background of the banquet table. Lord, remember Dane in your kingdom, said Father Kihohan in prayer pointing to the large painting of the Last Supper behind the altar of the small Indian church. Six of Dane's school friends carried his gray metal coffin from the church. Fifteen cars formed the procession to the cemetery on the edge of town. Following the service at the grave, the six young Indian pallbearers removed their honoring ribbons and placed them on the coffin. A cold Dakota wind blew across the slope of St. Peter's Cemetery. The six pallbearers were the last to leave the grave. Dane White, given the chance to live by the same laws as other men, might have been inspired by Thomas Paine and Chief Joseph. Dane So uh, Frank um, wouldn't have sent anyone else, Frank, you know, because uh, no one could tell the truth or perceive it in a way that he thought was publishable. And uh, it was really great to work for someone like that, where you knew you'd be assigned to something and it meant something. One more quick story and then I think we'll shift. Um, uh, Charles Abed. Uh, was mm -hmm. in federal court with the Mille Lacs Lake tribe in Minnesota, Mille Lacs Lake Reservation, sorry. And the issue in federal court was, did the Mille Lacs Lake people have the right to determine when was the best time to open up wild rice in the season? Duh! <laughs> but, uh, is, we know. is 10, 20, 30,000 years enough? Uh, you know, we kind of got this figured out. Uh, we've been through the apprenticeship and we have consulted the elders. We <laughs> talked about that earlier. Uh, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other federal agencies decided they knew when that was best. So this was a challenge in federal court. Extraordinary judge. No one had to hear this, but you'll be amused by the name. Justice, Federal Justice, Miles Lord. That's a lifetime appointment. <laughs> Wonderful person. By the way, he helped save Lake Superior by going after Taconite. And he shut down the industry until they cleaned it up. So, a really good. And also, Delcon Shield, uh, you know, birth control. He, this guy was fantastic. And he had a, a great compassion for natives and any issue where he could possibly see a good discussion and contest over their rights, he would hear it. So here he is. And the uh, Malak people decided not to speak English. They all spoke English. <laughs> so they come in and start talking, Mishnah Puhan, and the federal government doesn't have a translator. The judge says, well, figure it out. <laughs> so they have to go to the same people who are <laughs> bringing the case to be the translators. It was very... And Abed's very tall, unusual, very tall man. 
and extremely thick lenses so that his eyes were uh, tall and his eyes were magnified. Uh, really quite an imposing and powerful looking person. And he raised his hand during the uh, swearing in because he thought the judge was waving at him. <laughs> <laughs> of course he knew all of this, but it was, you know, he was doing it literally. And here's how the question went. Uh, what do you know? Well, I was there as a boy when old John Squirrel was talking with the federal men, and they said, plainly, this was our business and our right. That came through translation, and the attorneys, federal attorneys argued that's hearsay, it's not acceptable, of course. I mean, you know, that's a good rule. And uh, so the judge says, you know, you can't uh, tell what somebody else <coughs> said you have to, you know, tell us what you know. So he just shifted the story a little bit. You know, it just became, what I'm gonna say here now is something that I've worked on in literary criticism and it's native story. It's not liturgy, right? It isn't liturgy. Native story is a creative act, of course, because the story is never the same, never the same, because it isn't a recitation or memorized, it's visual. But that's not enough. I used to use that very early on. It meant something at first to say it's visual. I can envision it. No, no, it's more than that. Now we have to use something more like a hologram. In other words, it's a memory capacity that you can bring up the scene. And it's an ongoing scene of memory. It isn't even visual. It's something we haven't quite figured out yet biochemically that goes on in imagination where the whole scene is present and you can choose an angle or another character. It's like a brilliant kind of courtroom of the story I'm about to tell you because the evidence shifts. And that's what Charles Aubert did. And that's where I learned that theory from that dead man. So he tells the story in a different form. Judge getting slightly irritated hearsay, la da 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 And this goes on a few times. Finally, the judge said, that's enough. Uh, uh, make sure of shouting this witness understands what we're talking about here. Charles stands up, says in perfect English, if you don't believe what old John Squirrel said, then I don't believe the stories in that law, in those law books on your desk. Now, those were the laws of precedent. They were case <laughs> stories, case stories of the rules of evidence, right? They've been put together by other people's memory and sort of synthesized according to legal principles and the official practices of legal reasoning as precedent. Well, Judge Lord looked at the books, looked at Ovid and had an epiphany. He did, I'm serious. <laughs> And he said exactly this in a big voice, you've got me there. <laughs> and ruled in favor. It wasn't so much a legal ruling as just an opinion because this wasn't like a real trial. It was just that Justice Lord had such compassion for these issues and just saw they were being screwed right and left by the very lawyers who should have been taking care of them, federal lawyers. And I wrote that story. Now, I've used that story, I think, not you. I have told it differently. Uh, not, not, I reported it just as it was, because you know, that's what the journalism was. Like. It was about three pages, because it, I had to put in a little historical background to create context. Frank was delighted, because the guy who had the city beat was sleeping in his office. And I asked Frank if I could go do this story because reporters don't like you invading their, you know, their official territories. And he said, where is, what's his name? And I said, he's sleeping in his office. And I figured he would, but he wouldn't do this anyway. Go do it. I'll handle the fallout. Mm -hmm. And so it was published the next day. There was fallout. That guy got promoted to re reviewing movies. <laughs> Actually, he was really good at it. And he was very happy because that's what he really wanted to do. So I used that story in... Uh, theoretical interpretations and criticism on how uh, stories change in the demands and also 
this idea of hearsay, and most recently I developed it quite fully when the International Court authorized, not authorized, that's not the word, when they recognized that they will make use on certain occasions of hearsay in cases of mass murder, genocide, and such crimes internationally, because there are so few survivors in genocide that we must depend on hearsay to even have a picture of it. So that gave it a kind of new legal authority, and I wrote it then again in that context, in, in this new book, uh, it's repeated again. It inspired that story that this character in this book read in the Minneapolis Tribune, uh, inspired this Justice Molly Kresh to go to law school and develop her own fashion of legal reasoning on the reservation. So that's the, the sort of spillover between the different genres that you've written in is really interesting. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about another genre, though. I think I was going to move to something, but I think we should, we're probably running a little behind. I, wanna, I really want to have a chance to talk about the haiku. Um, so, you know, at the same time as you're writing some fairly hard-hitting, ironic journalism fiction, um, you also have this other very lyric voice. I wonder if you could talk about the dual origins of your interest in haiku, like the Japanese tradition as well as the Anishinaabe dream song. I was in the military, United States Army, trained, trained to be a killer on my way to Korea, but the ship had to dock in Yokohama and they only took the top part of the alphabet and sent them to be killed and they sent me to northern Japan to train in tanks. It all made sense. And uh, so I didn't get killed. And um, I had had the chance to meet, you know, real people. I knew on Hokkaido, which was quite extraordinary. I mean, what, what a, I mean, a breadth of knowledge I never even imagined I could have had by that experience. And then Japanese, and any Japanese, rural, farm, city, anywhere, had scrolls of great haiku poems by great haiku poets. And I was, so moved by that. I didn't have a scroll of Shakespeare. I didn't have a scroll of Milton. And I didn't have a scroll of a mission on your dream song. And I, was, I learned something so simple that I was embarrassed by it. But I'm old enough now. It's such an antique. It doesn't matter. Because I confess it. You know, to realize something about culture and literature, the Japanese knew their literature. I didn't know mine. I didn't have one. First of all, Native Dream Songs were oral, badly translated by a wide range of people. Uh, not always badly translated, but you can't translate something. So take that as a kind of impossibility rather than that. And uh, prepositions and such things, and the pronouns are in, in pose, and the time, sense, and place. Uh, things that aren't in it are necessary to comply with the dominance of an English language Germanic grammar. Okay? Okay, that's what I mean by it. it's not possible. And surely Shakespeare, maybe Chaucer, but you know, not Milton or Shakespeare, no, not my literature. Maybe it should have been, but it wasn't, you know, it isn't it's great literature, don't misunderstand and not implying that. But nothing like the Japanese, you know, they knew this. So then the next stage for me was to see the similarities in imagery. I was really uh, hot to discover how metaphor and tropes and things like that work in language. Practiced it, you know, because I learned it from haiku and then I found it in dream songs. Well, I moved past that long past that, because it's not comparative. You, know, you can't compare things. You know, that's initial, you know, aha, you know, wow, some similarities. But then it's integrated. It's a, what I'm going to call a recognition of a kind of creative motion 
that I call a visionary emotion. You can not only read it as something moving and not fixed, right, if that's the kind of a good metaphor, is to keep it in motion or action. So, motion. Then I've added in the theoretical development a visionary motion because good creative literature is visionary. It's not just descriptive. So it's not just journalism. And you can't find metaphors in journalism. They shouldn't be there. Uh, they're there, of course, but they shouldn't be. They stretch really hard to keep them out, but they're all the more powerful then. Uh, so I found this, and then I grew with this kind of integrated, imagistic, visionary trans motion. You know, it's more than motion, it's trans motion, it's visionary. And I could find this in uh, native and indigenous art, literature, dream song, creation stories. What is it? Well, it changes every time. It tells. And it's the metaphors in the haiku. Let me give you one. Uh, uh, this is um, Matsui Basho, 1644, lived 58. Uh, here's one that's most often translated. Ancient pond, a frog jumps in, sound of water, or splash. That's a different translation. Well, what do we have? Ancient pond. Uh, well, an ancient pond in that context is Buddhist. This is a meditative place, a place of beautiful concentration and and uh, meditation. I mean, completely at ease. And a frog jumps in and stirs it up. I've been the frog a large part of my life. <laughs> and a mongrel, mostly, mostly a mongrel. A dog. So, and uh, the sound of water. It's in motion, and if you just give a little bit more to that beautiful image that is so concise, everything's in it. Tradition, motion, change. Ezra Pound is going uh, on the metro uh, Concours, uh, Paris, uh, the metro station. And um, he writes this imagistic poem. Apparition of these faces it was a crowded metro station. Apparition of these faces in a crowd. Petals on a wet black bough. It never stops. The apparition keeps going. Of these faces keeps going. It's a crowd. It's petals on a wet black bough. It's a season. It's in motion. It's visionary. It's a Anishinaabe dream song. The sky loves to hear me sing. Can you imagine the native Anishinaabe singing to the clouds? The sky loves to hear me sing. What beautiful arrogance that is. That's how the haiku and things came together. So um, maybe to transition a little bit then, to give you a chance to talk about the fiction. Do we have, yeah, maybe we should. Okay, do you want to, I, I have a million more questions. Should we do this again in a, like, I a few more years? I couldn't be concise to uh, Kim's questions as I do in haiku. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll do the interview in haiku. <laughs> but do you have questions that you would like to? Um, yes, are we doing a mic or how are we doing that? Just Shout it out. Okay, Lane. I can shout it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been wonderful hearing the story. So I, I have to, I have to ask. Um, would you talk? I, I, I need to contextualize. Some of my students are here in um, uh, an English um, undergraduate class, and we've just finished our semester reading Bearhart. <laughs> and so. For, for them and for me and for any of us who, who, who love and are confounded by that, by that uh, crazy piece of work, could you talk a little bit about that and, and uh, you know, whether, 
whether it's getting it published or, or, or the process or just any, 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 anything that, that connects with, with what we've read. Thank you. That's a urgent <laughs> test. Still is. I've had more trouble in my life with that book than uh, even AIM. When I wrote about them, didn't cause me as much trouble as writing about <laughs> the loss of petroleum in America. It came from a pretty simple observation, which everybody's probably had. Do, does America have a culture when petroleum ends? Interstate, TV, you know what I mean? Uh, could anyone get around without a car? I mean, it, it is catastrophic, you know. It's the creator of the country, the world is so incredibly dependent upon petroleum and supply of it, political power. And there was a crisis uh, about the time I conceived the story. I thought about writing it, and then shortly after I started it, in fact, during Jimmy Carter's administration, there was a shortage in America. And I had to wait in the lines uh, uh, several times, so it gave it an urgency. So what happens to natives living in northern Minnesota when there's no longer petroleum and people are hitting on the roads and some people have stored a little gasoline and have power, you know, of a kind? And I reversed the Western as a kind of allegory. I reversed the ongoing stories of settlers going west and having everything beautiful attacked and ruined by these savages. I reversed that. Had natives driven off their reservations because they still had timber and that was valuable now that there was no longer petroleum, and they're going south to a place they can live in the southwest where there's no demand on population. And uh, they go through some of the wildest and craziest experiences you can imagine, including the plastic places, the plastic faces. These were people whose faces had been disintegrated by chemicals they ate and were exposed to, and they had plastic places covering their damaged muscles. These were a tribe of people. That was the most haunting for me, to put that together. Well, of course it would be violent, and, uh, and it is. Most of the violence, though, is a integrated experience where um, the ingenuity and survivance of strategies of a person are overlooked because of their needs to assert something or claim something, and the weakness of beliefs and traditions make them vulnerable. And so they're, you know, they pay the price on the trip, and those people who are quick-witted, perceptive, change, and change their circumstances, that's another aspect of the allegory. Now I'll sum it up. Uh, the book scared the hell out of me. I wrote it in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, I rented an office to do it in downtown St. Paul, most of it. I came home at night, and having written some of those scenes, I, uh, I was in terror myself. <laughs> and um, remember, I'm not the reader, right? I'm the writer. So I bend in the imaginative act, it's different than the reader. And I had to get over this. I was afraid to walk certain places. So to overcome it, I deliberately walked in the most difficult, potentially violent, violent places in Minneapolis and St. Paul at midnight to get past my fear. If I can't do that, I can't do that in this book. Okay, it's published, and a good friend of mine who taught at uh, Community College in Minneapolis assigned it without reading it. Did you get my emphasis there? <laughs> and um, so, you know, this often happens. You, ah, there's another, I love him, I'll put it in, I'll help him out. And so she signs it, and it's later in the quarter, that's what it was then, and she didn't get to read it until a couple of weeks before. Calls me in a panic, 
he says, he say, I've never done this. I can't <laughs> teach this. And I said, I didn't tell you to sign it. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, I wrote it. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do? You've got to come to talk to him. I can't talk to you about this. So I did. I had to. She was a good friend. And here's what happened. Classroom, a little bit of an amphitheater, just slightly, maybe 50 seats, probably 40 students. Community college, maybe two thirds native, mostly older, you know, 30, because they've been in college, came back to finish. And then a few elders, too, uh, a mix, but mostly native. And uh, I could feel the heat coming out of the room as I came down the hall. I, I, I'm serious. If she hadn't told me the number, she didn't come with me. If she hadn't told me the number, I would have been able to find it by the heat. <laughs> and I came in and it, I mean, I've been shunned before. We've all been shunned. Magnify that by deep hatred shunning. Like you're about to be dismembered in the way you wrote about it. So I said, listen, don't say anything yet. This was spontaneous on my part. I said, um, I'll just say, one thing, a little bit of context, and then you can have at me. Is there anything in this novel that you have not already read in a newspaper? I totally spontaneously disarmed you. I see. Then what bothers you is that I gave you more of the story than the newspaper did. So then it became a learning experience, and I must say, it was one of my best. But then when you're faced with death <laughs> and dismemberment, you know, survival is, is, uh, has to be generous. And it was, and I, I survived. But I learned something, too, about myself and how to teach Did I, you want to do a little more? No, that was good. Is that good? Okay. Uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it has, uh, someone just did a dissertation, I'm sorry, a thesis, master's thesis in uh, Nebraska, English department, asked me to read it. I didn't want to because I don't want to have to reread the book again, you know, I mean, I wrote it. And I'm not the reader, I'm the writer, and so, but I want, just want to pass on, I thought, I learned something here about her critical approach. She said it's a different kind of rhetorical strategies in this novel where the author introduces things to the reader so that they can understand the scene. And I looked at the book and thought, well, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> uh, but it's nothing new because that has been my strategy in writing because, but this was the first novel. I even did it there without even being aware of it, that I'm writing about things with <coughs> natives that are really complicated and there aren't readers ready for it because they're still hung up on the romance or the tragic and, or victimry. And those are the scenes that sell and I'm not in that category and never have been and won't be ever. And um, I write for the art of the story and the transmotion of the experience, which comes out of complicated sources and experiences, and that's my literature. And if you don't like it, read somebody else. Read Danielle Steele. <laughs> <laughs> but I bring that name up because the person who was translating Blue Ravens, the first World War novel, um, Danielle is her name, French, and I just love her. She's so fantastic. And she just finished it, but in a recent meeting, she told me that she loves doing books like this, like mine, but she really has to make her living on Danielle's field <laughs> because it's so easy. But she said, she read Bear Hart when it was first published. She was traveling in the U.S. Some hippie friend passed it on to her, and um, she read it then and wanted to translate it immediately, and now we're working on possible translation in French. She thinks it would do well. I don't want to have to answer for it in France, though, because they'll make it anti-American. So here's something just linked to that slightly, if we have time, is um, 
the bivicarious word hospital. Isn't that? Yes, that's in there. But I was thinking about um, your own relationship with language and how over the years you have created visionaries, right? You have created these words that have become sort of the vocabulary with which many of us talk about native literature. Um, so, um, I to, uh, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. What was the, the impetus? I needed the words. Um, I think the most successful, if that's the way to describe it, the most widely used. Survivors. Survivors. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's so widely used, nobody, lots of people don't know where it came from. <laughs> well, I needed a word that was as powerful as dominance, a condition. Is there somebody who doesn't know dominance? Dominance, of course, you know the feeling of that. That's a condition. I wanted the word to have the same kind of um, energy and, and urgency and the passion, you know, of a condition. And survivor, you know, you know that's passive. Found it in the old English dictionary derived from the French, survivant. It was used to describe largely the in rights of inheritance. So it has a general context, too, of survival and survival. But I just emphasized the aunts, I didn't have to invent a word at all, just emphasized it by saying it's a condition of survival that is, we can't define. You can't define dominance, it's a condition, right? You can, sur you can define a survivor, you can pick examples, you know, but this is a condition, poetic in a sense, and so surviving is done really well. I've had to find words like this uh, all over. Post-Indian was another, struggling with this problem of Indian, uppercase Indian, dominated by Capitalization rules, grammatical rules, right? Uh, and an inventive name. Now, I don't want to take anything away from people who are fully comfortable with Indian. I, that isn't my business. But as a writer, I don't want to deal with it because two ways. One, the Indians are in India. And Indian doesn't have a reference. There is no linguistic reference. That's what bothers me. And people can use it because they don't w worry about that. You know, it, it still works. You say Indian, everybody knows what you're talking about. I want to make it more difficult. I, you shouldn't know what you're talking about that easily because it isn't that kind of word. You know, it's a convenient word of dominance. It's been a grammatical and cultural dominance of discovery through India. I worked really hard at the Minneapolis Tribune to get rid of it. That story of Dane White, I couldn't do it because, but they were wavering there. And it was only maybe six months later they started using native. But I didn't want it capitalized. Why not? Because that sets it up as having some significant meaning. What's wrong with saying native and then you provide the context? And if you can't provide the context, then you shouldn't be using the word. Hmm? Is that strong enough so? Survivors post Indian. I first started off by saying, we're not Indians, we're after the Indians. That worked pretty well, because it was, you know, the uh, 80s when, you know, postmodern thought, and, you know, the good discord mo discourse moment by adding a post to something. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of titles come out of that stuff. And then it went, then it went to brackets and, you know, all that complicated stuff. <laughs> and now it's been so overused, it's ironic although the people doing it don't know that yet. <laughs> and uh, uh, so post-Indian worked really well because I could reduce the capitalization and make it Indian. It's no longer significant and it's after whatever it is that Indian is. Some, in other words, it isn't specific. You have to provide some context in however you're using it. And if that isn't clear then, uh, you should be rethinking the way you talk about native. Um, well, that's, oh, transmotion I already talked about. I needed something I was <laughs> observing or perceiving in, in native art um, and literature. Uh, most native writers, I, I'm not going to go into names right now, 
most native writers, contemporary, or yeah, contemporary. Well, especially the singers but, and storyers, but that is, that's in translation, that's a different problem. So these are contemporary writers. I don't know if they're aware of it, but their work is visionary motion. Now I'm arguing that this is envisioned in a lot of native experience. Um, even a PhD isn't successful in getting rid of it. It still comes up, and it especially is evident in art, motion. And I mean motion both in its obvious perception of imagery, Rick Bartow, for example, yeah, but visionary, right? That's motion, too, because it isn't representational, like Western portraiture, right? To use as an example. Uh, even some portraiture, you can find some motion, color, texture, but mostly it's representational. Native art and literature was not representational. It wasn't descriptive of here's who we are and here's how we jump and run free and ride horses. Uh, look at the ledger art. Look at it anywhere you want, anytime, and you'll see motion, visionary motion, those horses whose don't touch the earth. You see them in motion. Uh, go to the French uh, caves, 30,000 years. Uh, go to the images of them. And look at the horses and animals and some shamanic images motion. Not only is it motion, and you can perceive it, 30,000 years of it, but other artists and visionaries have followed it to add more motion. It's incredible. Early native art on stone and rock and birch bark. Motion. There's no static definition. It's like the stories. They're visionary. It's transmotion. It's always in motion. Our creation is motion. I'm here because of motion. My imagination is only possible through emotion. And the creation stories of natives everywhere are never the same. They're always in motion because how else could you imagine the creation but to give it a new powerful energy which includes people right here. If we were a culture here, we'd know a little bit of gossip about each other. It would fit in metaphorically to our motion, land, body, transsexuality of a great experience at this conference. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? First of all, let me say as a retired public defender, I wish I had heard no net objections to hearsay and being able to point <laughs> at the cases the way the facts are shaped by the judges before. But um, you indicated when extending that thing there that the international tribunal. Yeah. Um, they oh, that, was, that was the court alone specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But when I once was, I was out in. Um, Vancouver at uh, the time the courts were ruling on, on some of the um, First Nations rights to land, yeah. and treaties had uh, treaties had more or less stopped at the Cascades, or, um, and they hadn't signed them in British Columbia, and the court had decided they were going to allow traditional story as um, evidence of. Um, possession of the land by the um, First Nations. I'm wondering if there's this type of, um, beyond that example and the example of these days, <coughs> that there's um, a beginning of this type of understanding of the importance of the story in the indigenous people's claims and their identity and so forth um, within Western institutions. Oh, I think you've absolutely stated it. Yes, it is. Uh, not only in references to property, and these are new generations of uh, anthropologists or ethnographers with a greater sensitivity than you know, past generations of nomenclature of tribes. You know? And they're looking for things like that, and they're called upon to interpret the meaning 
not the translation, but the meaning of stories and cultures and how they're used to describe circumstances and situations. And that is good testimony and it is used. It's been especially useful in the recovery of Native remains and in interpreting Native remains. And it, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump for this. I, I can't make the transition fully, but it's a, a difference. Um, a priest abused hundreds of Native children in uh, British Columbia. And finally, it was brought to court by uh, a Canadian court. And he was found guilty. But the tribal community, forgive me, I'm trying to get out of using the word tribe because everywhere else in the world is pejorative. See? Mm -hmm. You know, Africa doesn't want to be a tribe anymore, and we shouldn't be either. That's still a legacy of ethnography, tribes. But, you know, see, it's embedded in this manger of dominant language that you know, we're supposed to celebrate. And, um, but this community, uh, pleaded with the court not to sentence him to prison. Imagine that. Now, there is the distinction of retribution and restitution. Uh, there are better words, and in every language you can find better examples. But White Earth did this informally. I'm sorry, not White Earth. Um, Minnesota, um, oh, no, I'm not even sure which reservation, Bluff Fort, maybe anyway. One of them, there was a county sheriff who was a native from the nearby native community who on his own, because that was part of his jurisdiction, not all of it, he was a county sheriff, but on, on the native land and with native people, when possible, he would carry out informal restitution. Mm -hmm. He would order individuals to return the things they stole and ordained and just keep it out of court, keep it out of that kind of litigation. This group pleaded with the court, don't sentence him, order him to return to our community and face us in a circle. And he did it. And that must have been deep humiliation. I want to add something quite postmodern though. A person like that it has to have a pretty powerful socio-pathological view of the world. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be hesitant to accept that as any kind of great recognition on his part. But that's a kind of cynicism that goes with, with that kind of behavior. Anyway, that, but I think that's part of the ongoing uh, recognition of different perceptions of, um, and it starts with Keenan's discussion of land bodies and uh, uh, the law ways of uh, native communities, the legal thinking or legal philosophies. Or you could say epistemology, except that is a textual thing. But the ways in which people envision um, responsibilities uh, in their communities and families, and they're different, and they can be discovered, and also interpreted and perceived in stories. I used to say at the end, this would have been a perfect moment to end here, and I used to say to my class at Berkeley at the end of the class, God loves you. And then they learned that it was time to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Only once in maybe 20 years, I didn't do it all the time, but at least five, six times a semester, only once did a student come up and say, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, after all, the way you talk about things, how could you invoke God's name? He's not a monotheist. And I said, you read me uppercase. You heard me uppercase. I was speaking lower. <laughs> <laughs> There's part of the story, too. So I think we're going to close with a different kind of conversation, if that's okay. If, yes, do you? Just wanted to say, uh, one of the breakout sessions tomorrow, 1.30, but I'm the third person on it, 
I'm going to talk about specifically the case that you're talking about, oh, the landmark boy. British Columbia case. It's not in my abstract. I just decided I had to focus on it. I couldn't say everything in the abstract. So, and I will appeal as the third one, and one of the one thirty bring up tomorrow. Uh, we're going to do um, a haiku exchange for haiku play, original haiku that we've both written, or haiku play, or a kind of haiku duel, affectionate haiku duel of imagination. <laughs> and uh, there were the swords uh, made out of bamboo or birch bark, uh, willow, and they don't hurt. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughtful attention, and um, I have to say something. I couldn't read that game like I thought I could, but I can't. I can write it, uh, but I couldn't read it. Because then I hear my voice, and I get so emotional about it still. And that woman I talked about, uh, I waved because I couldn't see anymore. Still, these things are still with me, and they're still part of everything I think and write. I visited that Dane White suicide many times, including going into the jail, asking the sheriff to go in with me and imagine the scene. Can you imagine, like, locking up a child in a county jail for 43 days on the charge of truancy? And I, uh, Premack said to me when I did the page and a half, he said, there's no, you're not leaving there until you find out who did this. I spent a week there. I mean, this was quite an investment for a newspaper. And I ended up writing three pieces. But it took a long time for finally the father of the boy, he remarried, to confessed to me and allowed me to say it in writing that he had conspired with the judge, the juvenile court judge, to lock up his boy to teach him a lesson. Mm -hmm. And, but meanwhile, the American Indian Movement uh, got hold of my story immediately and blamed the sheriff. And they ranted around, bannered, petitioned, wanted him fired, and I knew he had nothing to do with it. I went to him and he was very hesitant to agree to even see me because everybody was the enemy. I told him I wasn't. I knew he tried to do things. Here's what he said. My wife and I had to carry out the law. You know, they live right there, county jail. You know. And, but this boy, we brought him into our house for meals, but I, I, by law, I, I was ordered to lock him up. All day, I would take him with me on my runs. I couldn't leave him there, mm -hmm. but I had to lock him up at night. So he can't talk about me. So we're going to end with some beautiful imagistic scenes. Calm in the storm. Master Basho soaks his feet, water's dry. Feet on frozen ground, echo of Master Visner, crows in white pine. Fat green fly, square them across the grapefruit. You got that motion? <laughs> Here, here comes the trick. Honor your partner. <laughs> <laughs> Stiff-legged dog goes grumbling after squirrel. Old ears still flap. Even my shadow moves as I do in the moon. Listless October. Morning Lake Amir where sandpiper bends to water, brown beak meets brown beak. Thunderclouds, 
Leech Lake applauds at the dock. Crows mark the poplars. Iron cold and wild, a million wet blue acres drink in your smallness. April ice storms. New, new leaves freeze overnight. The world falls apart. Now, one to seven deer or haiku syllables weave through winter trees. Grace. Let me close with one humorous story. It's this poem, Fat Green Flies, Squared Crook. Bird ends across the grapes with honor your brother. That was a spontaneous poem. Let me tell you the circumstances. Um, about 40 years ago, uh, when I was 10, <laughs> <laughs> I was identified, uh, I was named one of about six poets who would be featured in a film about poets in the upper Midwest. I'm not sure where that is, but it was in Minnesota. And I'm never really sure where, what is the upper Midwest. And it was to uh, provide three parts. Make a film of a poet going to a small town and reading, talking, telling poetry and film. And at the same time, a bookmobile loaded with poetry would uh, find a place to uh, uh, sell books, usually a bank parking lot in a small town. Wonderful idea. And then the poet with the film crew would show up and do his or her thing. My assignment was Ellsworth, Wisconsin. At the time, I think they had one stoplight uh, in town. So I show up uh, with uh, the cameraman assistant, sound and assistant, and a couple of other manager, director types, so, you know, a party. We're walking down the street. It's totally spontaneous. You know, I don't know what we're going to do, what, you know, what I'm even going to say. And I see it. A uh, fellow walking on the other side of the street, maybe 30, 40 year old guy carrying a paper sack, a newspaper sack. And I motioned him over very cautiously, six or eight strangers in town, you know, and so he comes over at a distance. And I said, uh, We're doing a film. I'm a poet, and I'm going to read or talk about a poem, and they're going to film it. And I said, Do you suppose if I went over to that uh, coast to coast store across the street, you know, went in and read a poem of some kind, and he backed up a bit, and he poetry, weirdness, <laughs> and, and looked at the coast and coast and said to me, no, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I said, why not? Said, oh, no, no, don't do that. So we walk down the street, and here's a family restaurant, a small one. Uh, it appeared to be when I walked in, mother, father, and an older daughter. Um, she looked kind of worn. I think she might have returned from Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, but that's adding uh, a, a, a novel to a haiku. But, uh, and so there's maybe 10 stools at a bar and you know, maybe equal number of tables. Not many people there. And um, I say, here's what we're doing. And do you mind? We'll buy food and sit at the bar and I'll say a poem, and then you just respond any way you like. They'll film it. So she looks to her parents, I don't know this for fact, but soon, and they go, you know, like, the crazy people, but if they're buying something, it's okay. So we order things, and then uh, we get ready. And this poem was spontaneous. You know, I had apple pie and coffee, and I said, fat green flies. Square dance across the grapefruit. Honor your partner. <laughs> and uh, now to make this more filmic, put a coffee pot in your hand. <laughs> there wasn't, but to make that more filmic. <laughs> and backs up and I said, just whatever comes to mind. That ain't what we do with flies around here, mister. <laughs> in the same play as about 16 
65 or 8, right? Basho writing ancient times, frog jumping, splash. <laughs> Thank you. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, the only place you can get it in the world is on the table outside. So.